everyone. Thank you for listening to the Integrate Yourself podcast with Allison and Allison Pillow and Maya Gottlieb. Today, our guest is uh, Dr. James Hollis. Um, Dr. Hollis is a uh, Jungian analysis in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. He is also the executive director of the Jung Society of Washington. He has published 15 books, which have been translated into 19 languages. His latest books are Hauntings and Examine Life. His, he lectures widely on the five on five continents, and you can reach him through his website is jameshollis.net, and you can find information about him and his lecture schedule, where he um, offers um, many topics because of his books, array through our whole life's journey through the psyche to the uh, in depth psychology of the Jungian work of Carl Jung. Um, he is um, a, an amazing uh, lecturer. I've had a uh, couple of times uh, uh, the pleasure to uh, be a part of his uh, lecture. And then just recently in Atlanta, he lectured on uh, living more fully in the shadow of mortality. And then the following day, we had a workshop, which was Living the Examined Life, which was about his book, The Examined Life. And it's 21 steps to take toward the recovery of our personal journey after losing contact with our natural source of guidance. And I just want to welcome Dr. James Hollis. Dr. Hollis, thank you for coming on our show. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to actually talk to you about was some great uh, quotes that you kind of implied but left the audience to decide for themselves was, um, what is the sense of mortality and wh- why should I live longer? And um, the reason why I wanted to talk about this was because we actually um, help people um, try to find their way through integrating the work that they find on their path. Um, both Allison and I became very intrigued on our own mishaps and uh, our own ways of uh, finding how to uh, do it right or do it wrong. So we're trying to take information and provide it to other people so that they can kind of listen to their inner guidance and then know where and who and what they are and their purpose and their meaning. So when people are trying to basically uh, live longer lives, like in more abundantly. Um, what is it that they're kind of uh, working with? Because we talk, you talk about the ego and how the soul's calling, but the ego is kind of driving the boat when it's a little bit of a you know, chaotic um, churning of who they are and what they are in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about how that process can be more, I guess, delineated into a more aligned place for someone? Well, of course, these are very large questions. And let me just try to set some background, if I may. Um, We begin our life tiny, vulnerable, and dependent, of course. And we have to sort of find our way, fit into the world, trying to um, get the approval of others, without which we will literally perish, and um, make ourselves in some way uh, a kind of provisional life in the world as it presents itself to us. We have no powers over how it is. We simply have to try to find our path to it and through it and, and fit in in the best we can, which means we have to be creatures of adaptation, and we all are, fortunately. And those adaptations allow us security, safety, and, and belonging, and all of those sorts of things. However, we often find in the, for, in the face of our adaptations, we also progressively get separated from something deep within ourselves, our own instinctual truth, if you will. Um, we, we begin to lose contact with those sources of guidance within us. The actual feeling function, we may be swarming with feelings, but which ones from, from all of that plethora of impulses within us are, are really coming from our truth, our depth, and which ones are reacting to the circumstances around us. Or the routinized behaviors that we have, we have to develop, we develop patterns. I've often said to people, one of the first places to begin your self-analysis is look at your patterns in your life. You don't rise in the morning and say, well, today I'm going to do the same stupid things I've done for decades, but there's a good chance that you will, because there's so much in our life that's conditioned by those adaptive patterns and by the sort of driving energies that Jung called complexes 
which uh, are, are really clusters of our history, which tell us what we can do, what we can't do, which, uh, again, lead us toward adaptation and fitting in, but often at the price of our, our own integrity. So whenever a person is obliged or feels necessary to examine oneself in a very substantial way, um, then the project of the second half of life begins. The first half of life is about ego development. And what do I need to do to be able to function in this world, to support myself, establish relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But in the second half of life, whenever that occurs, and it's not a chronological moment as much as it is a psychological moment, the question rather comes up, and, and so what is my life about really? Why am I here, really? In service to what, really? And, you know, it's, our condition is always bound by the fact that we're mortal. And you mentioned the uh, Atlanta presentation recently, and part of what I was trying to suggest there is that part of a healthy second half of life requires a continuing sort of awareness of mortality. Now, an awareness of mortality is not the same as the fear of mortality. Uh, it's, it's rather asking very pragmatic questions. What does my mortality keep me from doing with my life, or what is it forcing me to do with my life? In both cases, I need to examine that and, and see, you know, is that the kind of life I want to be living? Are those the kinds of choices I really feel good about? Are they confirmed by something going on inside of me? And many times we find the answer it, it, it's not. And so, you know, when, when we allow ourselves to remember whether or not you believe in an afterlife, and some people do and some people don't, this is the life we have. This is the one we know we get. This is the one in which we're conscious, relatively speaking. And therefore, it behooves each of us to try to make choices that we find are constructive and, and which are, are in some way based on what wants to enter the world through me. In other words, the first half of life is what does the world want from me? And so, we, as I said, we try to meet those demands, fit in as best we can, and create a provisional life. The real question after that, though, is what does the soul want of me? Now, soul is not a very sort of popular world, word in modern psychology. In fact, it's sort of vanished from modern psychology, but it really speaks to the question of our being that meaning-seeking, meaning-creating animal. In other words, more people suffer disconnect from meaning than any other single source of suffering in their lives. So if I experience meaning, I have a sense of purpose. I have a sense of the, the reason why in the face of whatever struggles and conflicts life takes me to. So it's a complicated question. This is, again, just sort of setting the table and saying that I take it from your questions where we are in this interview is to sort of examine, you know, what are the kinds of questions I need to be looking at in the second half of life to sort of recover my own path, to find my own personal source of authority, and uh, to be able to, to live a more conscious and um, self-directed life, especially because mortality frames it. And because it frames it, my choices matter. And I'm, I'll add a footnote here before turning that back to you. I find, sadly, that so many of our behaviors and patterns are fear-based, you know, fear-driven. And that's normal and natural because we're creatures of sensitivity and awareness of our vulnerability and so forth. However, there's a big difference between having fear and living a fear-based life. Big difference. So I find that most of the time we, at some deep level, know what's right for us. We know what our path calls us to. We know what is wanting to be achieved in the world through us. And, and yet there are various sort of fears that stand in the way of that. So in, in this work, ultimately it requires courage to face what needs to be faced. And if I don't have the courage to look at my own life in that way, you know, then, then I'm a creature of fate. I'm a creature of adaptation. I'm a creature of the thousand pressures and pulls that afflict all of us on a daily basis. So uh, again, what the project is, is to have lived this journey as well as you can in the light of the values that really make sense to you, not those that were handed to you by your culture, however well-meaning, 
or your family of origin, however well-meaning, but which seem to be validated by something uh, within that responds in a, in a positive way. When it's right for us, we know it. When it's wrong for us, we also know that. But again, from childhood on, we learn to overrule that in service to adaptation. So in, in a certain way, it's, it's that collusion with the demands of life that becomes our own worst enemy. You know, our patterns, our adaptations, our, our uh, safe places, those are the things that lock us into a smaller life. And as Jung put it so succinctly, we all walk in shoes too small for us. Meaning by that, we, we walk in these adaptive patterns rather than the life that we are somehow meant to live. Yeah. So it's a long-winded way of responding to your first thought here. Oh, it was wonderful. It encompassed a lot. And um, your ability to just uh, zone in and figure out what this interview is about was really impressive. Um, the years that you have spent uh, with uh, different people and talking to them has uh, probably been the most cherished thing you've probably done if I had to uh, pick yeah. something. Um sure. Because the human nature is is incredible. Uh, Allison, uh, did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, I just thought that was a great point to bring up about the value system because our value system can be different. Like, you know, getting to a certain age where you realize that, or maybe you don't ever realize that you have a different value system than your parents or what what you adapted to or even society and getting to that stage in life and, and then having the courage to um, live those values that you get clear on for yourself is a huge, that, that was a great point that you made there. I like, and that's kind of how I see it. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you meant, but that's what, that's what it was for me. <laughs> well, of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when I was in Atlanta, I, I mentioned the novella written by uh, Tolstoy, uh, published in 1885 called The Death of Ivan Illich. And Ivan Illich is a name very much like John Johnson, so he's supposed to be an every person kind of character. And Ivan is a person who gets the message from his culture, do this, don't do that. He, he follows the rules. He, he adopts the right social values, the right practices, the right political and social opinions. He goes to the right school. He marries the right person. They live in the right suburb. Um, and he, uh, you know, goes up the career ladder and so forth. And everything is about fitting in. Life is supposed to flow smoothly and pleasantly, as, as he believes. And then one day, uh, a pain appears in his side that doesn't go away. And it's an annoyance. And then it's uh, nagging. And he goes through the stages of dealing with that that Kubler-Ross later defined in her great work on the stages of death and dying. First was, of course, denial. Um, secondly was um, anger at the interruptions to his schedule and his uh, plans. Uh, thirdly was um, bargaining, making any kind of deal with anybody or any supernatural source as possible, none of which, of course, works. And, and then fourthly is depression. And then fifthly, he, he actually asks some meaningful questions. What if my life has been wrong? What is it? What if it hasn't been my life. And Tolstoy never names the illness, but it's consistent with cancer. And, and essentially what's happening there is um, he, he lived a kind of untroubled and therefore unconscious life. And when he's forced a question, it's for the first time he becomes a real human being. He asks a question, what is my life about really? And interestingly enough, nobody wants to talk to him about that. It's all about they're busy with their schedules and their lives, and, and it's his problem anyhow. And he has three last days of conversation with an illiterate peasant who's assigned to take care of him. And it's the first truly meaningful conversation he's ever had. And then he dies, and his wife wants to um, get the estate settled as quickly as possible so she can move on. Um, his colleagues want to move up into his position in his uh, profession. And everybody wants the funeral service over quickly because they have a card game that night. In other mm -hmm. words, it never strikes anybody. This could be applicable to me. That's you know, Yvonne's issue. It's Yvonne's life, not mine. And, um, you know, why would Tolstoy have written that? You know, 130 years ago, approximately. 
except that he saw the same phenomenon. How much of our lives are carried on automatic pilot? And how much are, are you know, conditioned reflexes and, and so forth? So, you know, in, in examining that, Tolstoy was seeking, obviously, to, you know, summon the reader in 1885 to some kind of consideration of why am I here? Really, in service to what? Am I just a, a wage earner? Am I just a parent? You know, that's a wonderful profession. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a parent and a grandparent, but at the same time, I also know my life is, is another kind of process somehow. And unless we ask those questions, I don't think we ever really keep the appointment with our own soul. And we all have an appointment with our own soul, and not everybody shows up for the appointment. That's, that's clear. Which is great. Um, I, I love the fact that in your book you talk about how um, meaning is actually finding us. Like one of the things I noticed was, you know, when uh, when I experienced, you know, teachers or somebody giving me some guidance was, you know, they asked me, you know, what's your purpose? What's your legacy? And at the time when I had that question asked to me, I was quite quite confused. Uh, you know, it was these questions of I still didn't know what I didn't want. And, and so as life has kind of journeyed on for me, I find that now I do, and maybe I can answer that question. But when I read that you said meaning is trying to find us, it kind of takes the pressure away for us all to try to conclude right away your, uh, you know, either your legacy statement or your mission statement to who you are and what you are, because it's always changing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, in saying that meaning is seeking us, um, what I'm really suggesting there is that we don't create meaning. We, we either live it or we run from it in some way. Meaning is something that's inherent within us. It's something that is intrinsic. It's, it's really what we mean by the word soul. Soul is simply a metaphor. I'm not speaking in traditional religious terms here. I'm just using it as a metaphor for that deep essence that each of us is. And when we're in service to that, and we can't be all the time, that's clear, but when we're in service to that, there's something inside of each of us that supports us. Something rises to give us a sense of purpose, a sense of reciprocity. When you invest in it, it comes back purposefully. It might be full of conflict, it might be full of suffering, and so forth. The people that we would most admire throughout history are people who had lives we wouldn't want to trade for. They might have been lives full of conflict and suffering. But mm -hmm. we admire them because somehow they were true to what was most deeply held within them. And that that's why we honor them, that they were faithful in some way to um, who they most profoundly were and what was calling them as, as a person. Now, when when... Jung described this. He talked about that being the summons of the individuation process. And by individuation, he didn't mean ordinary individuality. It's certainly not narcissism and self-absorption. Quite the contrary. It's finding something truly worthy of, of, of investing your energies, of your service. I mean, we all have to earn a living. We have to serve our relationships. We have to pay our taxes, et cetera, et cetera. These are legitimate trade-offs with the world around us. Uh, and, and that's fine. And many people think that's, that's life itself. The question always is, is what is wanting expression through me? I don't mean in any sort of grandiose way. It doesn't have to make an impact on the world. It has to be simply that which is true for me and that to which I am trying to be faithful. Now, to give you a quick example, the one thread that's run throughout my life has been teaching. When I was a child, I was curious, and I think every child's curious, and um, I was just deeply grateful for school teachers. Well, it was always a little scary in school, like with other children. I was deeply grateful for learning from them. And, and throughout my life, the one thing that's been constant has been learning and has been teaching. Mm. And um, I've been teaching at the college level for 53 years now. It's a long time. And um, I've just always valued the learning process. I think working with other people is still part of that learning process. And if I've learned anything along the way, 
I share that, which is what teaching is. It's, it's sharing what you've learned on life's highway. So for, for me, that's my calling. You know, as a child, I might have wanted to play for the New York Yankees, or I might have wanted to be president, or a thousand things that a childhood's fantasy, or I might have wanted to be a fireman, you know. But um, my calling is somewhere else. And it's a humbling profession because you never know enough. You never have stopped learning. If you do, you're dead. So I, I'm just saying that for me, and everybody else is different. For me, the service to learning and the teaching process of passing it on has has always been the thing that's given me the deepest sense of purpose and 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 sort of connection with that sort of mysterious energy that runs through the universe and runs through us because when you serve that it serves you that's the paradox you Mm. feel the support and energization of that and when you are running against your own grain, as we often do, it leads to burnout, exhaustion, self-medication, anger, depression, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the, from a psychodynamic standpoint, we don't try to repress symptomatology. We rather ask the question, why has it come? You know, what, for example, when I was, uh, what really I think launched me on into this project of, of working with Jungian psychology was a depression at midlife. My early life, I was a, a teacher, a, an academic, and that was rich and valuable, as I mentioned, but something more wanted to be engaged. And so at midlife, I had a depression, and for the first time, I had to really stop, like Ivan Illich, and say, you know, <laughs> What, what is this life about really? Is it possible I've been living it in a way different from what my own soul is calling for me? And that's not always a pleasant conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. And so out of that came a whole different career, a whole different second education, so to speak. And, you know, a, a separate uh, mission, if you will, for, for the um, second half of life. So uh, again, we have these encounters. I mean, we can be doing what's right for us for a certain stage of our journey and then have outlived it, mm-hmm. you know, or, or we, we will find that what works for a certain while is no longer applicable to the territory we find ourselves in. So life is a series of attachments and losses, attachments and losses, and it's a series of departures. And when we're not departing from where we have been, psychologically speaking, um, then we're stuck. We're dead. And, um, you know, something sours in the personality. And that's what produces psychopathology. Mm-hmm. So what I was about to mention was, you know, at midlife or whenever it happens, if we experience a depression, you know, seldom does it occur to us to ask the question, um, I know where my complexes are pushing me. I know where the ego is pushing me. I know where my outer demands are. Um, why has the soul, which is you know our translation of the word psyche, why is the psyche autonomously withdrawn its approval and support from the places where all of these other energies are investing their priorities? You know, if I'm doing the right thing, why do I not have that sense of inner satisfaction and so forth? Mm. And, you know, that's always humbling because it tells the ego, well, you're not really the boss. <laughs> you know, you're in charging, you're in charge of executing the projects and in, in the world, you, you have to carry through and see these things happen, but you're not the boss. And um, when you violate what is more deeply authoritative, authoritative in you, um, you know, it's going to protest. Yeah, and simply, it does. <laughs> yeah. Could that be why so many people go through the what we call the midlife crisis and they get divorced or they make these major changes in their life because maybe they're just conflicted um, or not really paying attention to the deeper part of themselves that's telling them to switch gears, maybe. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, and look, with with respect, the first half of life is pretty much a, a big bumbling mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, have, you know, it's kind of like um, I've had so many well-meaning parents say, well, how do I advise my children so they can avoid these struggles? It's like you can't. No. Yeah. What you have to say 
um, is your experience. It's not applicable to them. They've got to find it in their own way. And, and when we talk about midlife, that's why I was trying to make a distinction between the chronological and the psychological dimensions of the second half of life. Because Ivan Illich didn't awaken until the last few days of his life. It was not the chronological center. Often what happens, though, in the 40s and maybe 50s, it used to be in the 30s, and still is, um, is, first of all, a person has had choices, has created consequences and patterns, has created more or less that provisional life. And then the psyche weighs in with its opinion. So, you know, you have to have some history to reflect upon to even examine it, number one. Number two, um, you, you, you have to be able to have enough ego strength to bear looking at yourself and perhaps taking that all apart. Now, I'll give you a quick example. Many years ago, I was asked to, to give a talk on the psychology of relationships to a, uh, a honors college seminar on relationship. And it was uh, a, a good seminar. I mean, they, they were very thoughtful students, mostly juniors and seniors. And it was a three-hour uh, seminar held once a week. And the first 90 minutes, we talked about the psychodynamics and the mechanisms of projection, transference, and other psychological phenomena that occur in every relationship. And then we took a short break, and then we came back, and I said, now let's try to apply what you just learned to your current or your recent relationships. And it was like the curtain came down. These yeah. were bright, talkative kids up to that point. At that point, not one of them had a single thing to say. And the reason was, at 20 years old or 21 years old, it was almost unbearable, unthinkable, that I am living in an unconscious way in this relationship, or that dynamics I think I've left far behind with my family of origin are playing a role in the selection and engagement with this person, or that I might be accountable in some way for the relationship that just blew up in my face. In other words, <laughs> intelligence had nothing to do with it. What, what, what it was about was having enough experience and ego strength to bear to look at that. Mm. I remember having two thoughts. Um, one, I'll see you when you're 40 and we'll have a different conversation. <laughs> and, and two, this is why I left behind college teaching. No disrespect uh, to 20 year olds, but yeah. it's like, you know, what do you have to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, and, and we'll talk when you get older. And yeah. uh, it's, it was a different kind of conversation. Yeah. So, again, the point simply is that the first half of life, uh, again, speaking of half very loosely here, is, is about stepping out into the world, building ego strength, learning to function, learning to be self-sufficient, learning to be reciprocal in our relationships and, and so forth. And the second half of life is, if we're lucky to have one, is... So ask the question, so why am I here really? What is this life about? I mean, what is my purpose in this life? Not defined by others, but defined by something inside of me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, an infant knows this. It's called instinct. The infant's life is governed by its inner truth. But because of its, again, powerlessness and dependency, it's obliged to daily make those adaptations and sacrifices that leads to that internal estrangement. So we, we lose contact with our guiding source. Jung said once all of our problems come from one source, and that is separation from our instincts. Uh, and Nietzsche called us the sick animal. Now, on the other hand, the social contract has the right to legitimately ask, you know, compromise with us. You, you learn to use a knife and fork. You learn to stop at a stop sign. These are not unreasonable expectations of the social contract. But we're talking about the other kinds of adaptations where, again, you lose contact with, you know, that inner sense of your own internal guidance, if you will. Mm. Well, it's interesting that you bring up um, our humanness in terms of like being in nature, because um, I find our, I, I'll say generation, but the, 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 the group of people that we uh, like to talk with and kind of get into uh, conversations with are people who are getting back into nature and 
kind of utilizing ways to um, either be in nature or um, experience more of a, a human movement in nature um, because there seems to be a, an expansiveness that kind of happens when you've gotten that call that says, hey, this isn't working. And then you go into nature and you kind of feel that rejuvenation. And and science also says, you know, because we are indoors all the time, our nearsightedness gets affected by not being outside and looking at far distances. So um, all of that affects us so greatly. And so when we go into just looking at our habits, you know, and how we kind of conformed ourselves, it made me realize how important um that uh, finding your inner calling may be just to be outside for a little bit more than you have been the other day, you know, kind of getting yourself into your true nature. Well, you know, as if you step into nature, whether it's the mountains or the forest or the sea, you're, you're really repositioning that ego. You're reframing it. It's not mm -hmm. the potentate sitting on top of your life making these large decisions, you know, it's repositioned, reframed, and is very tiny in the face of the very large. Yeah. And that the, that, that helps, I think, that's sometimes why I think people want on vacations to go to the mountains or the ocean or wherever. It's because there's something in us that longs to have that sort of resizing, as it were, that mm -hmm. reminder of we're, we're very tiny swimming in a vast mystery. And, you know, just earlier this week I was reading about their having discovered uh, another sun with eight planets just as our sun has. And it's a thousand light years away. They can't even see it, but they can tell by uh, interference in, in, in wave uh, measurements that the gravitational pull indicates that. And you, you begin to think about how infinite, and that's one of the near systems. You know, <laughs> wow. At least a billion solar systems have been discovered. And, you know, when, when I stop and reflect on that, it, it helps reposition my irritation that the newspaper was late this morning. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, traffic is heavy or something like that. Right, right. And, and that's when we're in some way standing in right relationship. You know, Jung said... Life is a short pause between two great mysteries. And I think two things about that, you know, it is essentially mysterious. And, and it, no matter what people think about it, we'll wait and see, right? You know, that's only human theory. The, the important thing is to say, all right, to recognize this short pause has to be as luminous as I can. Not in terms of world standards or external standards, but in terms of you know, what it is within me that, that is valid and which is confirmed by my experience. Yes, uh, which is impactful in the way that, you know, doesn't keep you in that um, I haven't done enough. It keeps you in that same statement of I'm comfortable where I am in terms of who I am and my acceptance of myself, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, and, you know, it's it's natural and normal for the ego to test itself. I mean, there's a place for ambition in life and to figure out what you can do, uh, how, how far do your wings take you. Um, and that's, that's, again, a necessary agenda for learning about yourself and, you know, setting off into the world. Having done that, to keep sort of doing that is rather infantile because it, it means that I'm, I'm still being in some way defined by that that drive for power, that drive for validation, mm -hmm. and while those are natural human needs, their their prevailing keeps one in a kind of driven and an infantile position. Um, rather, is the the question: All right, what is it that feeds my soul? What is it that feeds my spirit? Um, what is it that gives me a sense of purpose and and commitment and direction? And that's a different question. You're right. And yeah. it means shifting the focus of one's and energies, you know. And, you know, so the same, for example, in writing. I mean, there was a time in my life when I was in the publisher parish world and something in me rebelled. I, I wrote a book 
uh, when I was very young, because I was expected to, something rebelled, and I didn't write again for 20-some years. I was, by that time, I was out of academia, and I started writing on subjects that were important to me, rather than things I had to do to prove my capacity for research. Um, I, I found that I was not a researcher. I could do it, but it, there was no joy in that. Um, what, what I found was there were subjects such as the mental passage and the swamplands of the soul and, and, you know, questions like that, that were really the ones that, that spoke to me. So that's when the book started pouring forth. And they only have come out in the last, what, 20 years, you know, 14 books in 20 years. And it was like all of that time, those, those books were there wanting to be expressed. Um, and it was almost like carrying eggs, you know, the eggs mm. are there, but they have to in some way be open. But if they had been open prematurely, you know, it, it would have been just bad. That's all. It would, wouldn't have worked. I, I, my head was full of knowledge, but very little sense of why is this so important to you? What does mm. this mean? And in what way can this be helpful to people? see those are different questions those are wonderful questions to to be aware of because of the idea of um writing a book there's always that uh writer's block or that sense of like do i even know what i'm writing about and you know who who's done this before and all these little like ego ways of kind of you know, sabotaging yourself out of writing something. And then you talk to someone who has written and they said they, they, they just kind of comes through them. The same thing we just talked about earlier. And uh, that, what you just said really makes it clear. Like, you know, you needed to kind of nurture it in yourself before it could really kind of pass through. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, I could have written more as an academic and, and, you know, maybe added a few more lines to a, 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 curriculum vita, but so what? I mean, mm. you know, that and two bucks will buy you a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> I love your I, I love I, your reality. It's I, true. I found that it's, it's meaningless, you know. I mean I've done it, but I found it was meaningless. Yeah. And it's something else to write about something you really care about. And um, yeah. if someone else can profit from that, terrific. I mean that's 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 a bonus, but it's really secondary to, um, you know, allowing that process uh, some kind of uh, expression. I mean, through the years, I've had so many people say, well, I will always want to do this. And, you know, there's a but in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to write. I wanted to learn this language. I want to learn the piano, play the piano. And there's always a but in that sense, which is really what that is, is a complex that comes up and, in a sense, shuts them down. Because if they, if you push them a little bit and they say, well, I don't, I, you know, I, I can't take art lessons. I can't draw a straight line. Well, art's not about drawing straight lines, if you may have noticed, you know. Um, you know, if you make music, it's for you, not for the world. Right. It doesn't have to be at Carnegie Hall. It's because something in you wishes to express itself musically. How about honoring that, you see? In other words, the, the voices we have in our head about feeling foolish, a feeling that somebody will laugh at us, somebody will be critical of us, um, uh, or, or whatever we have to do or say is unimportant, those are complexes. You know, we weren't born with them. We picked them up along the way. And, and again, a, a complex is simply a cluster of your psychological history. It's charged with uh, energy. It affects your body. It affects your feeling function. But it also has uh, a kind of splinter narrative attached to it. If you do this, you're going to lose that person's approval. And that activates an old field of anxiety. Or if you do this, you're going to feel ridiculous. Or someone is going to laugh at you. Right. Whatever the hidden message is, and often that's unconscious, when you ferret it out, you realize its origin has, you know, some some place in your early developmental history but we stay wired so to speak to those places in our psychological history and that's why we tend to stay stuck that's why we avoid uh, living what wants to live through us that's why we live sort of contained narrow cautious and sometimes sterile lives 
That well, is so true. <laughs> <laughs> As you were speaking, I I was the the whole dynamic of social media came up for me and how that is um how the importance of getting likes and get and building an audience that way is has become a, a social norm for people and, and a part of their ego and their uh, self worth as well in a, in a big way. Um, I also heard you say in one of your interviews something to the extent of like as you build an audience or the bigger the audience, the less consciousness. Uh, it has, it is, you said something, I don't know if that was exactly how you said it, but can you speak to that and also how you think, where you think we're going with this whole social media dynamic and, and what it is doing to people or how is, how, how is our psyche adapting mm -hmm. to this, you know? Well, there are several questions there, frankly, that you yeah. just asked. Um, <laughs> first of all, I personally have nothing to do with social media per se. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, it's probably a good I'm, idea. I'm, I'm using this medium as a teaching function. That's why I said yes. You know, uh, I, I I I don't get involved with it, but I know many people who do, and that's fine. Um, it's interesting how while the internet connects us, it also atomizes our lives in the sense it produces more and more um, isolation. Mm -hmm. You know, people. I mean, we're sitting here talking to each other via a computer screen. And that's good, given the distance between us. But, you know, people live their lives in some ways separated. I mean, I know people communicate who are room apart, communicate by, by such means. But, you know, again, the social media is also, you know, a great invention. But wherever an invention, a technological breakthrough occurs, the human shadow follows quickly. Mm. And we know, uh, driving to work this morning, I was listening to... Um, NPR here in Washington, and we're talking about how hate groups have never had better recruitment in their life except through social media and how they've taken over certain sites and, you know, fascistic groups and neo-Nazi groups and, and anti-Semitic groups, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that, that that's the dark side of human nature. It fills in the gaps very quickly. So, you know, it's, <laughs> we're going through a, a revolution in the sense in which for good or for ill, we live in the information age. And at some level, we're drowning in information. Again, but information does not equate to knowledge. Knowledge is trying to understand how this relates to that, what, how, what's the purpose of this, and how it, it um, you know, what's the structure of it, and, and, and what is its value. And that, and knowledge alone is not yet wisdom. You know, wisdom is, is seeing this in a much larger context and how it, how it affects your life. So we're drowning in information. We saw uh, evidence, there's plenty of evidence from national sources that maybe even elements of our recent election were hijacked, you know, by the subversion of the internet and social media and, and trolls and people, political groups and so forth. And I don't see that diminishing. I think it's only going to increase. So it, it, it will become, as it already is, in some way an unreliable ins, uh, instrument, even as you have your identity hacked and so forth. And, you know, I can't even go to a doctor anymore without having an online account with them, literally. Mm. Wow. And, yeah. and, you know, so anything that's online, you know, somebody has access to. Right. And, and so forth. So there's, ironically... <laughs> In trying to build community, we're also losing our individuality. We're losing our, our anonymity. We're losing our privacy. And we're subjected to the onslaught of, of the human shadow. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed blessing. And um, I, I, I know people who are withdrawing or, you know, not, not practicing with social media anymore. And, and the reason for that is because they, they found themselves in some way in, as you said, building a certain kind of ego gratification on the one hand, having in some other way, having to respond to people all the time. It was in, in a significant way taking them away from themselves. Yeah. You know, and that's, again, one of those phenomena that separates us from ourselves. Mm. That's why all of my writing and work in the last, you know, few decades 
<coughs> has been a, is about helping people, you know, reconnect with themselves. And, um, you know, people don't come in and necessarily say, well, it's, it's, I'm in the second half of life, so it's time for me to keep my appointment. <laughs> they, they would that way, but they might talk about a relational crisis. They might talk about a depression or talk about a loss of meaning and purpose in their life. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, you know, then, then you begin to realize, all right, another kind of conversation has to occur here. A conversation between you and your own soul. Mm. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody be in therapy. I'm not suggesting that everybody's an introvert, because clearly they're not. I'm talking about how easily we are distracted from that kind of conversation with our own soul. Right. That itself is not new. In the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, the famous French mathematician, inventor, and mystic, said once that the court even though these were the wealthy, privileged people who could sort of purchase anything, the court had to invent the gesture because if they stopped and paused and reflected on their own soul, they would quickly grow miserable and fearful. Uh -huh. And the gesture was invented to distract them. The phrase that Pascal used was divertissement, that means diversion. So we live in a culture whose chief treatment plan for existential anxiety is diversion, mm. you know, 24 seven. You can plug something in, turn it on, have the illusion of connection and essentially be at the end of your life, um, profoundly disconnected from yourself, from nature, from each other and, and from yourself with all these wonderful tools. So it's a, it can be like a Trojan horse that is a great gift, but it actually leads to, um, you know, a further sense of uh, self-estrangement. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, that was a great uh, answer. Thank you. Yeah. One of the questions I have, and uh, I know we're getting close to the end, but uh, I just simply wanted to talk a little bit about um, the second part of life and my version of what I'm seeing with my 90 year old uh, mother-in-law, which is a gift. I know she's showing me a lot of things, um, but it kind of relates to the idea of letting go of the material world and letting go of your um, ideas of um, the timeline that you had of like, this was bought there and this was this gift from so-and-so um, but the idea of the souls, um, like, I don't know if it's, this is kind of how I want to phrase it, but maybe you have a better way, is the cleanup aspect of not leaving all these um, things kind of to others to take care of. Uh, uh, because it kind of really opened me up to really seeing how important it was to even my part of my life is to not be um, bogged down by so much of this abundance that we have every day and information that we have and, and what you talk about in your books, you know, that we just really attach so much to certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned a moment ago that the great treatment plan for existential anxiety was diversion. You know, that steady hum that keeps us from reflecting on our lives. Uh, it's also true to say that the operative religion of the Western world, uh, by that I mean where people invest their values, their, invest their, their energy, is materialism. And it's been so for a century approximately with increasing uh, urgency. In other words, in, in the face of um, disconnect, in the face of feelings of emptiness, let's fill it with as many purchases as we can. You know, we're at a time when every newscast is, is reflecting on how quickly Amazon or somebody else or the delivery systems will get packages to people. I mean, it's a kind of crazy frenzy. What is that about? I mean, you've absolutely lost any connection to really what it's about. And, and, and it's like that material abundance um, is profoundly delusional. In other words, if it worked, we'd know it. Mm. Has it provided people an abiding sense of connection, purpose, dignity, and depth? And the answer is obviously no. 
And when one waits for the next iteration of an iPhone or one waits for the newest gimmick or the newest game or something like that, and I'm sounding awfully preachy, I'm not judging people who are caught in that. I actually feel sympathy for them because I, I think in the end it betrays one. That's the paradox. Um, you know, I have objects in my life. I'm, I'm talking into a computer. I have a television set at home. I drove here in a car. It's not the object. It's what we project onto it that makes the difference. And there's a lot of unconscious projection. We don't make projections consciously. It's an unconscious triggering of energy within us that goes out onto the other. And the projection can be onto romantic love. It can be onto materialism. It can be onto power. It can be onto any other and the other is in some way always going to be other and therefore will fail or let down or uh, prove insufficient for the magnitude of, of the soul's desires. So again, if purchasing per se provided an abiding sense of satisfaction, then, you know, then, then we'd see a lot of happy people, but we don't. We see people knocking each other down in, 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 in mega stores to, to grab hold of a new television set or something like that. And it's like, what is that about? Mm -hmm. that, you know, what is yeah. that about? It's a lot of human energy. To give you a peculiar example, everybody's heard of Epicurus, the ancient Greek philosopher, and they associate Epicurus with Epicurean, which means fine dining. Right. Well, ironically, Epicurus was arguing the opposite. He wasn't for or against eating. What he was saying was, we are pleasant creatures and pain-avoiding creatures. He said, however, most people get caught in the sort of axis of, of intensity. So we'll gravitate towards something that gives immediate sense of satisfaction, but it's obviously of short duration. So if it's a good meal, fine, it's a good meal. The second you've eaten... You don't want any more food. It's not, it has no durability. It is something that has to repeat, and therefore it produces addictions and, and dependencies and, and so forth. And he said there's another axis to this pleasure-pain thing, and that is duration. What, what abides? What gives uh, long-term satisfaction? What gives a, a sense of, of um, sustenance over time? And, of course, for him... Um, shockingly, as a philosopher, he said it's philosophy. That's the thing that gave him a greater sense of long-term long satisfaction. And I was just saying, for, for me, learning and teaching have been the Epicurean delight for years. Doesn't mean I can't enjoy a good meal or, or something else like that. It's just that, you know, in, in this plastic throwaway culture, there's something inherently disappointing about it because... Mm -hmm the next object will be the one that disappoints me in the end. Mm. I remember a person once who had devoted her life to the fashion industry. She said, one day it occurred to me, I'm giving all my energy to something that a year from now, all of us will think is ugly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so or, or, take to, or take 20 years to be uh, popular again. Or yeah. always... <laughs> Most of it never really changes if you actually pay attention. There's like fundamental stuff. But, you know, the thing is uh, that I see, too, is that marketing, uh, the whole basis of marketing is to help is to make people feel like they're not enough. So they're buying yes. these things to feel like they are enough. And that, I mean, I remember I mean, when I was younger, it wasn't as strong as it is now. But it really, I remember... I want to say like the 90s and early 2000s, it really started, uh, that kind of feeling started hitting the market pretty hard, especially in the fashion industry. And at my life, a time where I had just had kids and coming back from a pregnancy body and feeling yeah. really bad about my body and how I looked and my self-esteem and all that kind of stuff and having a new identity. And I just remember clearly that I was just like buying clothes left and right just to make myself feel better, just so I, you know, because I just... Uh -huh felt like so empty at that time so um sure. yeah that's uh i think it's a big part of it i think it is is often of course generating need where the need's not actually there you know you can create the sense of needing something or wanting something yeah because it's shiny and new like a new automobile or a new iphone or something like that or you're right that this will make your life more meaningful and purposeful and, okay, try it. 
if it works for you, you know, <laughs> good luck. In most cases, it doesn't. And, and there's nothing wrong with the object. It's what we project onto it. That's the point. Right, right. I think the part I want to add is um, the, the aspect of when I get to that age, if I'm lucky, of my mother-in-law is to start to have to let go of things. Yeah. And that seems so difficult in watching her, um, you know, it's like out of mind, out of sight kind of thing works. But when she sees it, it has these big emotional uh, components to it. And I, I kind of, you know, we had to move her into a senior living. And what really kind of occurred to me was half of these things are broken. Things are not as cherishable as she thinks they are. And it's like having a disconnect to having someone to say to you or say to her, hey, you know, um, you don't need this. It's okay to let it go. But that process isn't so easy, you know? Well, at at one level, we can understand how one's uh, sense of self and sense of history can be attached to certain objects, pictures, so forth. Um, In another way, um, you know, the, the proper aging process is about progressive detachment from the hold the world has upon us. Mm-hmm. Um, the ideal departure would be to relinquish our attachment to life just as we're leaving it, you see. Right. Now, there's nothing wrong with the life force. <laughs> That's not my point. It's, it's that the, the sort of ego-driven, complex-driven um, clinging to it is, is not only delusional because we can't hang on to it, but it also creates, you know, obsessional behavior and... Um, uh, and obsessions and compulsive behavior, and and also um, leads ultimately to disappointment and and so forth. So, you know, the German word for serenity, Gelassenheit, means in terms of its component pieces, the condition of having let go. You know, to let go of the ego attachment to something provides one a sense of serenity. Yeah. And, and that's why in all the 12-step groups, the so-called serenity prayer is about knowing all of your frenetic behavior is just making things worse. And you have to let go of that in order to be present to other aspects of your life. And, um, you know, if, if ever there's been a failed religion, it's materialism. Mm-hmm. And yet, by and large, it's the one we have. I mean, it's the yeah. one that, again, yeah, occupied, you know, Jung said... You know, a person's religion is where they really invest their daily energies, not where they think they say, but, um, you know, when, when the pragmatic question is, where do you really put your values? And, and materialism is, I think, in lieu of deep connections to one's own soul, to the soul of others through relationship, and, and through meaningful uh, participation in life, you know. Um, and, and that, that, you know, Freud said the requisites for sanity were work and love. Well, obviously he didn't mean drudgery, but he meant work that's purposeful. If it's purposeful, you know, that's part of how we fulfill ourselves in this, this world and, and, and love as well. So again, underneath all of this, there is some kind of energy. That's all we can describe it as an energy that is autonomous, that was there from the beginning, that is constantly present, and which is uh, supportive and directive um, and instructive when we pay attention to it. Yeah. And when we don't, it pathologizes, which means it's going to express its disfavor symptomatically. And, and often that's what brings people into you know, the therapy uh, setting with me. Um, not that they're bad people in any way whatsoever, quite the contrary. They're usually very well-intentioned. It's, it's that something inside has not been valued sufficiently, that it's, it's expressed itself in some distressing form. And again, that's the invitation to a different kind of conversation, which I think makes one's life, um, frankly, more interesting and certainly deepens and dignifies the, the meaning of one's journey. Right. Wow. I mean, as always, your eloquence and ability to express the uh, words uh, that um, just seamlessly come from your inner self just makes um, 
makes makes everything seem a little simpler. So I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your books. Um, they are treasures of of just sweet um, and uh, basically sweet little secrets of life that I think if you just picked up one and just looked at maybe a, a, a just a page or two, you'd find something that was re- relative to the reader. It's very impactful for me and I have been um, blessed to have been able to been to your lectures to talk with you today um, and um, hopefully we can talk with you one other time in the future um, hopefully social media will um, help us uh, provide a better platform where you know information that is as impertinent like this could be um, given to people in a way that everyone can decipher and discern stuff better. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just say, I am grateful if those books and lectures have been helpful to you in some way, but you know, that's what a teacher does. And I'm just doing what I do and serving a profession that in turn has uh, served me. And um, that's, that's a privilege. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Take coming care. on. You too. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>